Tyson, please welcome onto the stage. Dr. Tyson, please. Thank you, Your Excellencies, uh, dear Gula, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to once more address this conference today. Uh, this conference is a regular on my annual agenda, and I think it's an important meeting place, um, and I always learn things. Obviously, Fatih, you always built the ground. Um, one number really stuck out today and surprised me, and I think there are a number of people in the room that are willing to challenge you. 90% uh, of all investments in 2015 in renewables is definitely a number that none of us has seen anywhere else, but um, if the head of IEA says so, we might have to check our numbers. Um, so let's see. Uh, the topic of this conference, again, is obviously of utmost importance. I think after COP21, the first time, let's say the whole globe came together to, to agree basically on a common effort, um, I think every country and every industry needs to revisit its agenda and to see whether it fits uh, to the public course. Um, I think these uh, decisions that have been taken in Paris reflect uh, world government's commitments, but they also reflect what people want. And uh, I think both, uh, at least what I can judge, uh, various countries in Europe, including my home country, Germany and Turkey, are taking substantial commitments and efforts uh, to meet uh, the, the desired uh, outcome. However, I share the view that if you sum up all efforts presently today, um, it is a surprise that Paris um, embraced even lesser numbers in two degrees um, while all efforts add up more to double of the minimum uh, amount. But um, sometimes it's like in business, if you don't have ambitious targets, uh, you don't get anywhere. And whether it's then in the end 1.5, 2.1 or something, um, might not make that big a difference, uh, but if you don't change course and uh, dramatically move in a different direction, then uh, the direction will never change, and, and that would be um, very disadvantageous for coming generations. I believe what, uh, what I at least personally see is um, that we see a fundamental um, change of drivers behind those commitments. Um, initially, it was uh, science and um, I would say a convicted core of people uh, that tried to move the political agenda. And secondly, I think it was politics uh, in various countries of, of our world that embraced that agenda and owned the agenda. Um, today, I believe it's uh, predominantly people um, that drive and own the agenda. So it's neither you know, the scientific um, um, secret circles, it's not even politics. I think it's people that embrace globally um, that agenda and truly want to live in a different world and see growth happening in a different way than the growth we enjoyed in the 19th and the 20th century because people feel uh, that this globe has limited natural resources and whilst uh, one can last for another one, two, three, four decades, at some point um, it gets tough and thus people, people call and drive for it. And obviously, I think the second change that I see as a dramatic effort, and there, Fatih, I share what you say, is uh, in the past, for a long time, one felt it's wishful thinking. Um, but today, like always when true change happens, technology has changed. Technology has dramatically changed. If you see the steep decline of deployed renewables, the opportunities of dispatched and local generation of energy efficiency that our Japanese colleagues so wisely has highlighted, um, then I think um, those things are possible. If it were just a, a wish, uh, I would say uh, even politics can wish for the best. Uh, it can't change tech. But if tech allows for it, uh, I would say the opposite. Politics would even not be possible to stop it any further even if one doesn't want to see a change to the renewables or local generation or energy efficiency, I would argue you won't stop it because
people will just deploy it. Uh, you can see it, that's in, for example, also in parts of the United States where one could question, is there a truly green agenda everywhere in all states? Um, but uh, I would t today say specifically the Republican states uh, see the steepest uh, move towards renewables and, um, and some local customer-owned solutions. And again, there I would argue it's not driven by the Republican agenda, it's, it's driven because of the ability of local customers and industries to just do it. And uh, there is um, advantage. Therefore, I believe this agenda will be with us and um, we should not be like Don Quixote uh, trying to ride against the windmills, uh, rather to take uh, the winds uh, in your back, uh, which makes the pathway forward much easier than if you try to walk against it. Um, one to just numbers that admittedly are not just driven by people, what we were once, but still are driven by the second phase of the time when policy was owning and politics was owning the agenda. Uh, we are one, my company, E.ON, is one of the, mo of the major suppliers of, of power in my home country, Germany. So a very significant market share. Um, total of six million customers, representing then, if you double by two and a half, I don't know, 15 million, 16 million people living in the country. Um, if you, predominantly in the rural areas, but in the north and the east and the south. In our, if I look at our grids, our distribution grids, we can measure how much power that we just happen to transport, shift and lift and move is renewable in just these local grids in the last year. 80%, 80% of the power we lifted, shifted, transported and distributed was green power. Um, the total consumption part in the country is still around 30%. So obviously the rural areas um, may be different. And very often people say uh, energy change only happens in the cities. I would say, yes, they will be a main driver, but don't underestimate rural areas because they, they open or they offer what you need for the renewables, which is space. In the past, we had very dense energy production where, you know, if you see how much room a nuclear power station needs, it's, it's extremely limited. If you tr translate that and see what room do you need to produce the same energy amount in wind and in solar, you cover whole areas of land. For example, the, the, the area we cover with windmills in North America would cover all of the urban center of Western Germany, of the Ruhr area. Just one company, ours, covers with windmills in the United States, for example, in Texas, but I can tell you it's a very, very empty country. We always look at Houston, but if you go to the north of Texas uh, in the Panhandle, you come into a very, very rarely populated area. And it's very windy. So I guess uh, no place for me to live. A little hot, a little empty, uh, and a little windy, uh, but offering great opportunities. So what road will we take um, forward to implement um, COP21 and now I would like to focus on Turkey. And um, I take uh, the privilege to talk a bit about Turkey, obviously, because we are co-invested with Sabancha in Energisa. And Energisa, one of the sponsors of, of the equation here, is today already the biggest uh, privately owned energy company in this nation. And the two owners have invested more than $11 billion in um, upstream, downstream, green, yellow, little brownish power, um, just to support the energy agenda of this country and to include 9 million customers and give them as sure access and safe energy. Energy, as I said, will become extremely local in the, in the future. Customers already today very often produce, consume, share energy, but one thing will not go away. You will, I at least truly believe, you will always need the connection. As telecoms and information needs the internet, and without the telecom lines of the internet, there is nothing. 
You can have the greatest hubs. If there is no access to them, no information flows. And the same is true for energy, and energy even a little harder because there is not yet found a way to transport energy through the air. You still need some fixed lines, pipes, or whatever, and therefore I believe whilst in the past very often transport of energy on the 380 megawatt level and things uh, on 380 um, uh, MV level was, was important because it connected these big nuclear, hydro, fossil stations. Tomorrow, the lion's share of the energy equation will play in local grids. The role of transport grids will get less important and the role of local grids will get more important. That is also according to the studies of a lot of agency that see that these local regional grids will see next to renewables the highest growth rate because they need to be digitalized, they need to be extended because they are not any longer just the outflow of some central lines. Like in the internet, where you also need to strengthen with fiber or whatever, people want to share energy with neighbors. People want to just at some time over produce, underproduce, share, and if they don't have access to that, none of that energy efficiency will be available. And therefore I believe, and that is an effort we very strongly do here in the country as energy sir, strengthening, deploying more capital, improving these local grids will be of utmost importance if you want to have a modern society with high energy efficiency, local generation, sharing and optimizing production, transport, and use of energy. Also, in a country with significant business and industries, and I congratulate Turkey for the very strong industrial base it stands for. I, I know a lot of European countries that gave up on industry uh, at some point and just wanted to rely on banking or services and desperately tried to re-enter the field of, of, of industry. Turkey never left it and now enjoys uh, the growth. The density of energy you need there cannot just be localized. There you also need significant central supply and dense energy. And thus Turkey will need, as the Under Secretary has rightfully emphasized, will need large hydro. It will need some fossil. Um, it will need gas to balance off the flexibility of uh, the volatile production from the renewables at some point because gas has the highest flexibility in that. And I also believe that Turkey is right. While it might feel a bit counterintuitive, Turkey is right also to pronounce its local coal as a transition on a transition phase. If that might be true in 50 or 100 years, God will know. Uh, but we also need to cover the, uh, the future in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And I think they're just making sure that the trade balance that is heavily burdened in Turkey under import of fossil fuels gets improved through a combination of big hydro and some local coal is just a smart adaptation. And I think it is acceptable also under a global climate agenda if it's deployed on high technology standards. And um, this is what we proudfully uh, can also stand for and we just uh, had the privilege of having President Erdogan at our Tufan Beli site in central Turkey in opening uh, the most modern, the most efficient uh, local coal plant in a very rural area that will be able to supply a significant um, part of the nation. Uh, we took pride out of the fact that we only are willing to deploy state-of-the-art technology uh, because otherwise it would be over-polluting and I would believe not acceptable for the nation. And thus I highly welcome that um, the Turkish uh, parliament also definitely um, uh, with your support uh, has decided to embrace this agenda and um, you have changed your energy law and given the government um, the right um, to carefully implement uh, a proper scheme uh, for the uh, support of, um, of an available part of, of local resources. So we're looking forward um, in how you will implement it in the country. And obviously, um, 
I would claim we broke, uh, you know, the resistance of others um, of deploying most modern technologies, and we are on the stage of now uh, commissioning the units, and thus hopefully uh, we uh, also want to talk to the president. Uh, I called um, that we will be included in whatever proper uh, scheme has to be implemented to find the right balance, and to just um, like to call your attention um, um, to just um, recognize uh, the efforts uh, that our engineers um, and our people of, of energy so did um, to bring this technology in efficient uh, ways uh, and climate acceptable ways uh, to your nation. Um, now, how will we overall dream about achieving the energy sectors in Turkey's uh, energy and climate goals. I think uh, some side conditions need to be obeyed. Well, I, I, I don't believe that there is a master plan where everybody knows what precisely will happen in the next 30 years. Things always change, luckily, because technology changes. But I think we need to recognize first that very enormous investments and commitments also of the private sector will be needed. If the state would invest alone, looking at trade balance and state balance, uh, I don't think that would be advisable for Turkey, and thus public-private partnerships, private investments will be needed. President Erdogan stated in his opening speech at Tufan Beli that he sees a need uh, of annual investments of 110 billion for the next decade. That is a whole lot of money. And um, I believe those will only be made if market frameworks are stable and sufficiently supportive and thus provide visibility to investors in a capital intensive business with long term acceptable returns balancing customer and industry's needs and desires. Um, I believe um, like in many nations there is still some recovery, some corrections to be implemented because the world changed so dramatically that also the regulatory system needs to adapt to such changes. Uh, the need is even steeper in my home nation, but also in Turkey I see some potential um, improvements possible and necessary uh, to properly reward um, those early investors and, um, and make sure that investments will be reliable. Um, I look at my friend from Siemens, that maintenance uh, will be spent. I see some nations where people now just cut all maintenance, uh, and at some point um, you will run into shortages or unavailabilities. Um, whilst in a, in a situation of total oversupply, um, that might be acceptable. I think in a country like Turkey that is sufficiently supplied, but you know, if you see your right vision of continuous growth, um, that will be consumed uh, rather sooner than later. And I would urge then uh, that uh, everything happens, that proper maintenance will be done and the plants, when we enter a shorter phase, will be really available and not due to wrong regulation or misled market signals, then uh, people have just uh, abused time and, um, and everybody wakes up with a shock. Uh, with the oil price, we remember, um, if a shock happens, the worst that happens is the price jumps heavily. Um, but usually uh, it's not that people can't move or anything. If power gets suddenly short, we know from South Africa and some other nations what then happens. This is not just a reflection of price, it is a pure reflection of availability. And then national welfare cannot be sustained, growth rates, expectations cannot be sustained, and thus one should never play uh, and take the security of supply too easy. Um, within this proper framework I'm calling for a second, I believe, one needs to take all areas of cross-subsidization between commodities and um, customer groups out. Usually at some point in a national agenda, there are good reasons to have such cross-subsidies because one wants to develop this part of the country or that part of an industry and this shifts or lifts a bit. But if one is in such a stage and if prices are luckily now, I would argue, low. When better will one find a perfect time to phase out subsidies? When prices are high, phasing out subsidies leads to significant shocks. So
sometimes for parts of the sector or part of an industry. If prices are low anyhow, uh, people hardly feel if one phases out cross subsidies, for example, for, for natural gas or for the benefit of industrial consumers or household consumers. Right now, I would say on those price levels, it's almost invisible. And then when, when the tide changes, uh, nobody, nobody will finger point at the government and say, oh, you less, lost our interest out. You know, um, there is this old saying, never waste a good crisis. Um, and if this is a good crisis, one could call it for the commodity markets, it opens the opportunity to phase out all, all subsidies, implement fair and balanced and open markets, and that will drive energy efficiency. It will allocate capital at the right point and will lead to long-term right solutions. And uh, thirdly, the third thing is, since I dearly believe that the world of energy, like the world of many, many other products in the world of digitalization and internet, will be owned by the people, let's call them customers or whatever they are, embrace them and thus liberalize all markets for the benefit of private and business consumers. Because liberalized and open markets provide the fastest and the best answer. And then people can deploy energy efficiency solutions, they can calculate, they can rely, and they are not dependent suddenly on unknown interventions of, um, of, of things. Therefore, we, it's on the agenda of your government, and, and we, we clearly would argue now also there. Uh, whenever was a better time to finalize something at a time of low prices and at a time of, um, of a competitive society that is ambitious like Turkey and that wants to be and run on its recovery agenda. We have made the experience across Europe and the Americas that open, liberalized, unsubsidized markets, wherever that one, one lets them work, obviously under some control of government that stability of supply is available, brings good outcome, involves the people of the nation, gives them the right to have a say in their energy equation, and then they suddenly deploy solar, they deploy local storage. I tell you, you now we sell now a local storage product for solar panels in Germany. By the way, they are at this point not fully economic. But you guess what? Porsches are also not fully economic. You can travel from left to right cheaper than with a Porsche. Uh, I hope nobody's here from Porsche. I have nothing against Porsche. They're a little deep for me. But, uh, but in any case, um, people sometimes just want something. And they see the privilege, the advantage of controlling the energy equation. That's what I said. Sometimes they are driven by, by climate. Sometimes they're just driven by, I want to control what happens in my house and with my house. And I want to be certain that I'm not dependent if oil price explodes in not 10 or 20 years again. Then I want to be certain that I have invested capital and now I just rely on my capital and I'm not rely on global markets. And that drives people. And by the way, it might be economic. If the alternative for them is saving the money and leaving it in the bank account, at least in Western Europe, at an interest rate of precisely 0%, if you're lucky, then investing into climate abatement technologies at home where you harvest from when you retire is, might be not such a dumb investment. And all of those things play together and thus, if you allow people to work, deploy and decide on the energy equation, these people will drive the agenda and then we don't just rely on government policy, we rely on our people. And those people, in the eyes of others, politicians are usually called voters, we call them customers, you call them voters, and embracing them and giving them the right to decide, liberalizing them, providing them with great grits, providing them with great access, as opportunities will pay off. And thus, I think those should be things on the agenda. And then um, I believe Turkey will be on a good path to successfully supply reliable and competitive energy to the nation, uh, to enable the people to drive the agenda and also to allow competitive industries that are willing to invest and work with customers to change the world and delivering the Paris agenda. Thus, let me conclude. The world is at a turning point.
countries and politicians have made substantial commitments. Technology is offering solutions. Now it's the involvement of the people and of the industries to bring the equation together. And we, E.ON and Sabancha, with Energisa, are committed. We have brought our technologies, our capabilities, our will um, to this market, and we continue to support Turkish political agenda. We offer our small advice to some improvements that might be possible to even drive the agenda faster and better. But we think we should continue, discuss, debate, and fight about the right path forwards. But we should never underestimate whatever we experts here in the room might see as the, most, as the best solution. Don't underestimate the 80 million people out there might decide differently and embrace just something differently, and they own the world. And that's what's true in most technologies, and it's now also true for the energy market. Thanks a lot. Uh, we, are, we are grateful to Dr. Tyson, uh, Chairman and CEO of E.ON and partner of Energisa. And now uh, Ms. Kular Sabanji will be presenting the Certificate of Appreciation of the Sabanji University, ICAC. Yes, Dr. Tyson is, uh, is been here for the fourth time this year. Thank you very much, Dr. Tyson, Chairman and CEO of EON and partner of Energisa. And now, after all these remarkable keynote speeches, Dr. Fatih Birol of IEA, the International.